Um, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, this is our second AQ information session. Um, Jody is going to be here to tell us a little bit more about the course itself. Um, and I'm going to chime in with some of the experiences that we've had with our first cohort of, of AQ participants. And we'll go from there and leave some time at the end for questions, if you all have them. Jody, I'm going to turn it over to you. Perfect. I think I just left somebody else in the room, so I'm going to keep my eye on that and um, make sure I let everybody else in that might come in a couple minutes late here. But good afternoon, Bowling Green State University. And um, as Chelsea indicated, my name is Jody Robeson, and I'm an academic strategist with AQ. Um, and I'm going to give a little bit of background on AQ, and then I'm going to hop in the course so you have an idea of what it is that you're um, looking at uh, and uh, signing up for and what is expected as you engage with the opportunity. So I'm going to shift into a PowerPoint presentation. And Chelsea, if you can just make sure and give me a thumbs up that you guys are able to see my screen. Um, so. And you see the PowerPoint slides. Perfect. Excellent. Great. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. So AQ's mission is one that I believe we share with your institutions and hopefully institutions across the country, and that is to ensure student success and equity through quality instruction. And we provide this opportunity um, for quality instruction through our framework, which um, includes four different areas or four different blocks. It's actually five different areas, but for the full course, we break it down into four different blocks. Your institution is providing you with an opportunity to go ahead and engage in the full course experience. Um, the full course experience covers 25 different modules. So as you look at the screen in front of you, you see the four different blocks that we have um, broken the course into. Um, as you look at it on the left-hand side, you see those little bullets under each one of those numbers. Um, they are indicating the competencies or the um, modules that you are going to go ahead and, sorry, I've got more people popping in. The modules are the competencies that you will go through as you engage with the course experience. Um, and I see there is a chat question, so I'm trying to go ahead. Thank you. <laughs> I, was, I meant to say that. Please pop in whenever you have questions. Um, so today in the course experience, what I'm going to go ahead and do is I'm going to hop into um, block two and I'm going to show you a module in the promoting active learning uh, module in the block. I also want to go ahead and share that as you look at the competencies or modules in front of you, each one of these competencies is research based and proven to impact student success. They are helpful for all students, but they're particularly helpful for students who are first time in college, students who've had less exposure, and students who um, are from low income um, families. So a great opportunity to support all of our students. These practices are, um, uh, they are discipline agnostic, they are level agnostic. It is just good practice is good practice to support your students. And we know that when these practices are implemented in the classroom, we move that needle and we have that impact on students. So just kind of give you a little bit of background as it relates to the course and how it is set up and the training. So the course is completely asynchronous. So you have an opportunity to work on the course and the materials when it works best for you. So if Barbara wants to work on the course at two o'clock in the afternoon, she can work on it at two o'clock in the afternoon. If she wants to work on it at 2 a.m., she can work on it at 2 a.m. If Thomas wants to work on it at seven or eight o'clock at night, he can work on it at seven or eight o'clock at night or first thing in the morning. So you have the beauty of working in this course when it works best for you. Um, we, as we came together and we created this course offering for you and for other faculty members across the country, we asked faculty to go ahead and come together in a focus group and to give us information and feedback that would support us to make sure that we prov were providing a robust learning experience for course takers. And we wanted to know what was important for them to see in these um, courses. And they said they wanted it to be modularized. So as you saw on the previous screen, we have 25 modules. Those 25 modules take about two semesters to go ahead and complete. Each week you are exposed to a single module and coursework is about two to three hours of work each week between the content and what you're gonna go through that I show you today, but also then you have to implement a practice in the classroom and then you write a reflection. Um, so you've got some additional time beyond just the course that you're engaging in. 
The other things that course takers or faculty members said that they really wanted for a robust learning experience was they said they wanted it to be high quality and video rich. And when we asked them what that meant, they said that meant they wanted to see faculty from different disciplines. They wanted to see faculty from different institutions. And they also wanted to hear the voices of students. Um, and they wanted to hear what was the impact it was having on students and what were they saying about these experiences. So you'll see that as you engage with this course. The other piece is you get to see these practices being implemented in the classroom. So I've been in the field of education for 25 years, gone to a lot of professional development and workshops where I hear about something, but I don't actually get to see a practice maybe implemented in a classroom. So you'll get to see faculty members talking through the process of implementing a practice in the classroom, and you'll hear those students then commenting on it. Um, it is collaborative. So you do have a cohort that you are going to go through this experience with at your institution. So again, while it's asynchronous and Barbara and Thomas can work on it when it works best for them, it is collaborative in that you come together in what is called an online discussion forum. And it's an opportunity for you to go ahead and engage with your colleagues across the institution and hear what it is that they're saying. And I said an online discussion forum, I meant it is an online discussion forum, it's an observe and analyze. And you have an opportunity to critique a video or a text exchange between an instructor and students who is sharing some practices that you've observed that are done well and some other practices that are at a developing stage. And you get to provide feedback and critique what it is that you're seeing that's done well and where it is that you might wanna suggest that this instructor go ahead and make some changes in the classroom. The other part of this um, portion of the course is you get to bring your own experiences to this portion and you get to say, these are some things that I'm doing related to this topic. And you get to share those with your colleagues across the institution. So you get to learn with and from one another. Um, it's also um, this collaborative cohort also provides you as an institution to come together with a common language as you're engaging with the course experience. So when you're talking to your faculty and other disciplines, you have a common language about what it is you're engaging with and the practices you're implementing in the classroom. It is facilitated by someone on your campus. That facilitator serves as a guide on the side or a mentor. That person is able to have their finger on the pulse of the institution, you as faculty members and your students, and can kind of go ahead and really direct the conversation, support you and your students best at the institution. Um, the facilitators, Chelsea, you actually facilitate. Um, do you want to go ahead and chime in here with any additional yeah. comments about that? Thanks, Jody. Yeah. So. Um, I, uh, as the director of the CFE, I lead the facilitation crew. So currently we have three faculty facilitators and I kind of coordinate all the facilitation and act as a liaison between um, AQ and uh, our facilitation team. So uh, in your particular cohort, you would see my name as a facilitator and then a faculty facilitator, um, possibly from one of uh, one of your disciplines. Um, the, the cohorts currently are set up so that they're um, in discipline buckets is what I call them. And so uh, we've done it that way so that uh, you all can have that common language that Jody was talking about. Um, Jody, when do you talk about the summary discussions? Because I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute if, if you are going to share that. I'll let you talk about it on one of my last slides in here because I'll pull up your screen and you can talk about that because you have them segmented four different times, correct? Okay, perfect. Um, so as Chelsea indicated, you know, she's kind of orchestrating that facilitation process um, at the institution, which is fabulous. The other piece that's unique with our course offering is that we require faculty to go ahead and implement a, a practice in the classroom, reflect on it, and uh, identify how they're going to refine it. So every module that you come to is going to have anywhere from two to four or five um, objectives, and then you're going to have anywhere from like four to 15 practices that you can implement in the classroom. We ask you to pick one. I always tell course takers, you know you, you know your content, you know what you're doing that week, and you know your students best. So what works for you that week? We also recommend that you pick a practice that is new or something that you learned more about. If you're picking something you've already done, we're not going to move the needle in the classroom. We want to go ahead and pick something that is different so we can see if we can shift the needle and support students to success in the classroom. Um, 
once you've implemented it, we ask you to write a little reflection. And if anybody's um, anxiety level went up because of reflection, I'm going to show you um, when we hop into the course that there are literally three questions you're responding to. And you always write to respond to the question. You do not, I've had faculty members say, Jody, how many paragraphs, how many pages? It is not an essay. It is not a dissertation. It is brief and to the point, answer the question and move on. So I'll show you how easy um, we can make your life if you use the template that is provided in the course. And one of the final pieces in those three questions is asking you, how are you going to refine it? And maybe it's simply something as um, little as, hey, this did not work with the content that I did this week. So maybe it's doing it with something, a different content at a later point in the semester. It might be a reflection that, hey, I did not explain something clearly enough to my students, or I need to provide additional time. But after you've implemented it, just kind of thinking about what could have gone different, what could I have improved, and making that um, refinement and reflecting on how you could do that moving forward. Um, the last piece is our course is evaluated by a national reader. So or our reflections are, are evaluated by a national reader. So that national reader is going through our norming processes at AQ. That person is able to go ahead and look at your reflection and give you feedback as to if you met the criteria. That allows your facilitator to facilitate and support you while you engage with the course experience. And that person then focuses strictly on that reflection and identifying if you've met the criteria. For me personally, I facilitated 14 of these. I didn't have time to go ahead and look at the reflections and read them and give people feedback. So it is a great opportunity to separate that out and really be that coach as a facilitator for faculty at the institution. Um, I will tell you, I, do, I did not mention this earlier, our course is, um, it is the only credential in higher education that is, um, uh, endorsed by the American Council on Education. So upon completion, you'll go ahead and have that endorsement from ACE. And I believe part of the reason why we get that endorsement from ACE is because we're asking faculty to write a reflection and to, um, to reflect on it, and that we're having somebody give you feedback as to if you met the criteria or not. So another little piece that you can go ahead and add to your CV as you're moving along. So here's that certificate that you will receive from ACE upon completion, or from AQ and um, ACE, that um, national certification. And I wanted to go ahead and just share, and I'm, I'm gonna kind of stop talking, but Chelsea and I got together and we reached out to some of your faculty and asked them to please share what are some of the takeaways that they're having as they engage with the course, because they're, you're already having faculty at your institution who are participating. So take a look um, and just see what they're saying. And you can see who's saying it too. So Chelsea reached out and we got some feedback as it related to takeaways. So you can see the different areas and some powerful things that they're saying as they're engaging with the course, what they're receiving from it and how it's helping them to go ahead and improve what they're doing and to support students to success. Um, they also were asked to go ahead and to share what were some recommendations? So if somebody asked you about taking this course, what were some recommendations that those course takers should go ahead and consider as they engage with the course? I'm gonna take a second here to allow you to read those as well. So it's clear um, the videos and scheduling time are really important. And I also love um, Sharona's comment here, payoff is being gains in student achievement and teaching excellence. Um, she also references to easily implemented. And I love Jerry at the bottom, that comment that um, prioritize and give it the time it deserves. So just wanted to kind of make a comment about both of those. Chelsea, did you wanna say anything? Yeah, I just wanted to also add to um, the comments that you've seen here from your colleagues. And that's that uh, one of the things that I've been doing with folks um, is really working on helping them create their own individual learning plans. And so each of the blocks um, or each of the modules opens in enough time that you can look ahead in advance and be able to 
choose the practices that you want to implement. And that's a really great strategy. If you're not sure, you know, maybe one week you're going to have a really busy week or you're not going to be teaching because you're at a conference or something like that. So planning ahead is really important. And that's something that I can help you do as well. Um, and there are lots of different ways to implement some of these strategies. So in I've been offering one on one sessions with myself. And then we do um, also offer weekly office hours where um, folks can just drop by if they have a quick question. And then obviously I'm also available via email as well. Um, so I'm here to support you throughout this whole process. So if you're unsure of you know, whether or not you'll be able to implement these practices, um, even if after this uh, information session, we can get together and we can work through a strategy to help you figure out whether this is something that you think you'll be able to do. Um, the other thing that I wanted to point out is we have had a few faculty members who um, have, I, I would say, complicated schedule, teaching schedules. Um, so, for example, this spring semester, we did have a faculty member who was teaching an e, two e-campus courses, two seven-week courses, um, but they were simultaneous. And then the second seven weeks she wasn't teaching. Um, so that made it uh, a little bit difficult for her to implement all of the strategies across the uh, first couple of blocks of the course, but we were able to figure it out by meeting together and really being strategic about, um, about the practices that she was going to implement. So if you do have a scenario like that, or you're on faculty improvement leave, there are some ways that we can maybe think through how to uh, best work around the scheduling issues that you might have. So you all are very fortunate that Chelsea um, does that. I did that at my institution as well before I joined AQ. And it is not something that is required, but it really supports faculty to success. And ultimately it supports our students because we're able to go ahead and implement those practices at a point that works for us and for our students. Um, I had nursing faculty I had shared with Shaq, uh, Chelsea that um, when we started the very first year, um, I had an instructor, she taught the first five weeks of the semester, that was it. We started week six of the semester, so she had already completed her teaching, so it was a great opportunity for us to come together and come up with a plan as to how are we going to support you to success and have you implement these practices moving forward. Um, so, as Chelsea indicated, you know, the other one piece that you have here is you have the four blocks that you see in front of you. Um, and Chelsea indicated that your blocks open at a given time. So you can jump around and you can see, okay, I have access to all of this. Um, you can look at the different modules. You can see what works for you. You might see, okay, it's telling me I'm going to start on a specific date, but I think that I would rather do a module that is set up for later in this block and do it earlier because it really resonates with what I'm doing this week in the classroom. So you have that opportunity because the block opens sooner. Your first block is going to open on a Thursday. Otherwise, all blocks are always going to open on a Friday. Um, so block two will open October 14th, and you'll have access to all six of those modules at that point in time. And you can see block three opens on January 6th, and then the fourth one and the final one is opening in February. You'll notice um, I worked with Chelsea, very respectful of your contract and the time that you are off and providing those break weeks in here. Um, you'll notice that the first module in each one of the blocks always has a specific start date. Those start dates are always going to be on a Monday, and your due date is always going to be on a Sunday. So the final due date for this entire block is going to be October 9th, but each module has a given week. So you're going week to week. So that's why you might look ahead and you might say, oh, I really want to do this module this week because it really resonates, as I indicated, with what you're doing in the classroom that week. Um, once the block opens, it stays open. So you'll have access and you can go back to it at any given point in time if you want to go back and look at something at a later point. Um, these due dates, again, are always going to be on a Sunday. Um, if you need to submit something on a Monday, you submit it on a Monday, but you start on um, a Monday and you go to a Sunday, allowing you that opportunity to implement that practice during the week when it works for you, and then you write your reflection. Um, again, you notice that we've got your breaks in here, but Chelsea, this is the spot where you kind of wanted to talk about after each one of those blocks, you do something else that I love that again is an additional piece that doesn't have to be done, but it really is wonderful. You provide those summary discussion opportunities. So I'll let you go ahead and if you wanna chime in here. 
Sure, thanks, Jody. Um, so I have one thing before I talk about the summary discussions. I did want to reiterate with you all that uh, the due dates that you see for each of the weekly modules are suggestions. Um, and if you've been to fall behind, I'm not going to come after you and get on you. You're not going to lose any points in the course or anything like that. So it's not necessarily like a traditional course where it's really, really time bound. Um, if you happen to fall behind, there are times during the, the semester or during the block that you can make things up. You can, sometimes you can skip around. The only caveat there is that um, by the end of, I think the, around the first month or so, you have to have two modules completed in order to stay in the course. So that's the important deadline that you need to remember should you uh, continue to take the course. So about the summary discussions, um, at the end of each block, since we have three different cohorts uh, that are, um, kind of buckets of disciplines together. Sometimes that can be a little bit of an echo chamber. What we've decided to do is after every around five or six weeks, we all come together uh, in a synchronous discussion. Uh, currently we're doing them virtually, but we can talk about that and maybe figure out if it's something where we want to come together in person in the fall, um, but I'll leave that to <laughs> When, when you decide to take the cohort or not. Um, but the summary discussions are where we come together and we just reflect on what we've been doing with all of our, our practices, kind of um, celebrating our successes and then seeking feedback and maybe looking for suggestions across disciplines. Um, you know, an area that's not yours, you might get some ideas and uh, there are some really creative discussions that happen across disciplines. And so um, during those summary discussions, your facilitators come together and we, uh, we have a kind of a loose agenda, but everything is much discussion based and it's a chance for you all to get to meet each other. So it's a great kind of networking opportunity across campus. That's all I had, Jody. Thank you, I appreciate that. And I appreciate you commenting about, you know, you might fall behind and things happen. So it's really important to recognize, reach out to Chelsea and say, hey, you know, uh, this is a challenging time of the semester. I'm doing midterms or whatever it might be and catching up at a later point in time. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and end this portion of the course, and I'm going to hop in the actual course and give you a little bit of a taste as to what the course is going to be like. So I'm going to go ahead and make sure I have that, and I need to make sure I share my audio. So. And can you see my screen? Okay, perfect. So our course lives in Canvas. Um, our course has also, I did not mention this, but our course has gone through the QM rubric. So I know QM is very important to um, institutions. So the beauty of that is as you engage with this course experience and pedagogically sound practices to implement in the classroom, you're gonna see that, ped, um, that QM framework that we know supports students to success. And in this case, you would be the students. So I have this in our demo model. Um, and then what you'll notice is just like a QM course, there's always gonna be a start here folder. Um, so I'm going to go down and I'm going to hop into planning effective class discussions. Your course experience is going to be focused strictly on face-to-face -face environment. So you're going to see demonstrations in a live classroom that you can implement. Um, even though you're in a live classroom, you actually have resources to implement these practices in an online form if you choose to go ahead and implement it in an on online form. So in addition, You'll notice that QM piece, you're going to see that each one of our modules, once you've gone through it one time, has the same components. So there's always an engagement piece. There's always a listen, watch, and learn. There's always going to be a deep in thinking, practice and reflect, and then a close strong. So I'm going to hop in the course. And Chelsea, if you can just make sure that when I go ahead and share the video that everybody can hear the audio, I want to make sure we can hear audio. Our courses always start with an introduction. So I say, this is the, the hook, um, like we do in the classroom to engage our students. This is really kind of the hook um, and a movie trailer to kind of share what it is you're going to experience this um, module and get you thinking about what does this mean? What does it mean to effectively plan for my classroom? Um, our videos are always going to be timestamped and they're closed caption. So I'm gonna go ahead and give you an idea of how long it's gonna take you to watch it. So I'm pulling this up. Welcome to the AQ module on planning effective class discussions. In this module, you'll learn how to create thought-provoking questions. Great discussions happen 
because the faculty member structured the situation to facilitate that discussion happening. Ensure student participation. I ask my students to prepare the questions in advance of class because that allows them to talk about the things that they find most interesting or most intriguing in the readings that they have done. And increase student-to-student -student interaction. Being able to talk with my peers instead of just being talked at in a lecture is very valuable to me because I can test my viewpoints against like other people. Let's begin. So each one of our courses, as I indicated, you'll notice those um, videos are always time stamped. So you know how much time you have at the bottom. We have a previous and a next screen. So moving along in our course, you're always going to be asked a few questions um, after the, the introduction. Those, inter those questions are really kind of just asking you to wrap your head around the content. What does this mean to you? So I'm just going to throw this out there and I'm going to ask you question one. Um, in this case, and there's only a couple questions. Um, in a typical class, how many of your students come to class prepared to participate in the discussion? And I'm going to ask you to go ahead and throw this in the chat. Would you say almost all? Um, would you say three-fourths, half, one-fourth, or very few? If you don't mind just engaging with me and putting something in the chat. 25 half. Got a lot of half and a lot of a quarter. OK, so great. So I'll go ahead and just click on the half here. Um, when you engage with this little questionnaire in the survey here at the bottom, you're going to submit it. I know I was a bad student and I did not answer all the questions. Um, but the reason why I wanted to just go ahead and quickly do that is because I want to point out that you get to see the responses from your colleagues in your cohort. So you're not going to see that Chelsea said a half or a quarter or Barbara said um, very few. You're just going to see in general how many people are saying half of the students are coming prepared. So you have an idea as to what are my colleagues across the campus experiencing in their class as it relates to students' preparation for these discussions. Our next portion of the course, and if you go in and you see nobody's answered, you were the first person in the course, so come on back and see what your colleagues say. We always then go to our learning objectives. We always begin with a rationale. We go ahead and provide a reference. So if you wanna dig a little bit deeper, you can go ahead and dig a little deeper as to why is it really important to go ahead and plan for effective class discussions. In this case, you see there are a total of four objectives, um, four objectives. And then if you take a look at the bullets that you see here, each one of these is practices. These are those practices that you're going to be um, learning about and you select one that is new or one that you learn more about that you can go ahead and implement in your classroom. Again, it might be that week, but you might look at the module and you say, ooh, next week's module, that's the one that I wanna do this week because this really resonates with what I'm doing content-wise with my students. Um, but you pick a practice that works for you. Um, you see you have 10 practices. Some of them require a little bit more of a digger deep and more um, attention. Um, some of them are going to be easier to go ahead and implement in the classroom. But you identify one. Sometimes people will say, oh, Jody, I want to identify multiple to implement. Um, I'd focus on one, maybe two. Um, you can do it in one class. You can do it in multiple classes. We know that if we're implementing practices in multiple classes, we're having an opportunity to go ahead and have an impact on more students. Um, but you need to feel comfortable with what it is you're implementing. So you implement that practice that you're learning about. Um, there is a downloadable skeletal outline. I always tell course takers to download that. It is kind of a guide to walk you through the course experience and you get to engage with it as you um, go through each one of these pieces of the course, the objectives, the demonstrations and make notes to yourself. Um, and it also allows you to kind of have some ideas when you get to that implementation. Oh, I made notes to myself. This is really gonna help me as it relates to implementing this in the classroom. So I told you that you get to see demonstration videos. Again, videos are always going to be timestamped so you know exactly um, how long it's going to take you to watch it. Um, they're going to be longer than what you're seeing here in front of you, but they are maximum, I think, maybe nine minutes. Um, sometimes you'll see ones that are three minutes long. Um, if you don't have time to watch all of the videos and there are multiple videos, watch the video that speaks to you and that will assist you with implementing that practice in the classroom, and that will assist you with writing that reflection. So in this case, you also get to see who the individuals are that are in the video. And again, I'm gonna click on the closed caption. I'm gonna hit play and make sure you guys can see this. 
I think it was, sorry, moving along. It seems like it's seamless. It seems like you didn't have to plan as much. But it, the truth is, is there's actually a lot of planning that goes in, into it. We're gonna talk about the reading that you guys did for today, this reading, Sexual Assault on Campus. The best discussions are when you can provide a framework but be willing to be flexible. And that's to me what planning lets me do. I want somebody from your group to tell us something that you think was useful about this. I wanna start with you guys. What do you think about this? Looks like I'm buffering. Okay, there we go. So every syllabus on the front page has, here's my course outcomes, right? Here's what I want us to do. Think critically, be able to use evidence to make claims, make an argument, um, you know, use outside resources. And you can sort of write a paper and do that, but most of that happens. in action. You have to be able to discuss. You can't think critically without demonstrating that you're thinking critically. And so you have to do that in a discussion-based class. I will tell you that the discussion is much more fun and much more productive if you do your preparation in advance of the discussion. So here's what you need to do. You need to read the articles carefully. So please make sure that you have read all three of the articles and know them very, very well. I ask my students to prepare the questions in advance of class because that allows them to talk about the things that they find most interesting or most intriguing in the readings that they have done. You're gonna pose a question that's going to start a good discussion. You will have at least four questions for each article separately. Students have to come prepared to class. Part of their participation grades, they get points for it. 99% of those students will do the assignment. And when they come to class, everybody can have something to contribute because they've done it they have something that they can say about the topic. When I know I'm definitely going to have to talk about the readings, I'm more inclined to do the readings. So I always want to do the readings to make sure that I have something that is relevant and that can actually add to discussions. If you bail on participation, there's no way you're getting an A in my class. But like the one guy is just like being able to talk with my peers instead of just being talked at in a lecture is very valuable to me because I can test my viewpoints against like other people. You can tell that he's just being like naive about it. Well, what do you want to say about this? Um, that was actually the problem I had with it was that there's only one of the five that was like justifying it and saying it's not an issue, or I think in real life it's higher than that. I think there's more people that. You got to see the demonstration, you got to hear from the students and you got to see the faculty talking about how they implement it and the reason why they're implementing it. Um, you have two videos in this particular module. So again, if the other um, video was the one that could be used and help you to go ahead and um, implement that practice in the classroom, watch that video if you're short on time. If you have time to watch both of them, then watch both of them. I'm gonna move along in the course. Um, I would also go ahead and say that um, if, if you are looking to go back, again, please remember, once the modules are open, you have access to the course. You have actually access to the course one full year after it, or as long as the partnership continues, you can hop in and grab any of these pieces of information. Um, so you can go back and watch any of those videos and get a refresher. So we always have something called expert insights where we have people hopping in and kind of sharing some information about this practice and why it is so important. Um, and what I wanna go ahead and do is I wanna watch a little clip here for you. And just in this case, it is a speed drawing. So you get to see and hear voices of people hopping in and sharing the importance here as we see a speed drawing. Other times it's a podcast and sometimes it's an interview. Great discussions don't just happen. Great discussions are made to happen by instructors who understand that discussions take planning. It is a myth that great discussions happen spontaneously. Great discussions happen because the faculty member structured the situation to facilitate that discussion happening. Yes, occasionally there are times, there are events when you know serendipity strikes and you have a great discussion without really planning it. But you're much more likely to be successful in having a deep, meaty, thorough discussion that looks at an issue from multiple angles and multiple perspectives. If you, as the instructor, 
have structured the situation to facilitate that happening. Do your best. So again, you get to hear from those expert insights. Um, you heard from Jay Howard there. The next portion of our course is our implementation resources. So as I indicated, whether you're teaching a face-to-face -face class or an online class, you have access to all the resources. You just don't see those demonstrations in an online form. So your course, since it will be face-to-face, -face, will automatically default to resources for the face-to-face -face environment. You can see we have three tabs here. As you scroll down, you can click on any one of these individual tabs or links here, and you can grab that resource and it provides you with a step-by-step -step aid to go ahead and implement a practice in the classroom. If you want all of them, it's not showing on this screen. But this is my demo screen, I apologize. You'll have a link on the bottom that will allow you to download every single um, one of these resources with a single click as opposed to clicking on each one of them individually. So just please know that, that that access is there at the bottom. If you are somebody who is teaching a blended class or completely online and you want those online resources, where we have support for you is in that middle tab. If you go ahead and click on there, you'll see where additional resources would be for you. And you're just gonna click on the Chevron, pull it down and you have that single um, resource to click on here. We also have additional resources and this is for the readings, blogs, um, podcasts, um, to give you some additional information related to the course. So I'm gonna move along. The next portion of the course is our challenges and misconceptions. Um, my boss calls this the MythBuster section. Um, I always say for somebody who's taught and been in the field of education for 25 years, I have misconceptions and challenges, and I've kind of righted the ship here, so to speak, with some different areas where I had those challenges or misconceptions. There's usually anywhere from two to six in this area. Um, you can see in this case, they're asking you, um, discussions are best suited for arts and humanities and is not appropriate for math and science. And they're asking you if this is a misconception you have, yes or no. And then they provide you some clarification. So your misconceptions in this case, you have three, and then you have a challenge where they'll go ahead and provide you with some suggestions to go ahead and work with that challenge and that um, students do not feel obligated to interact with their peers during class discussion. So how can we do that? So it's an opportunity for you to dig a little bit deeper in that section. This is a portion of the course that um, Chelsea's heard me do this now several times. My favorite part of the course. I loved this part, part of the course. This is that observe and analyze where I mentioned earlier when I was giving you the presentation. Faculty see that demonstration of these practices you've learned about being demonstrated. Some of them are done well, some of them not so well. And it's that safe environment to go ahead and provide a, a critique of what could be done better and what was done really well. Each one of these videos, again, they're timestamps, so you know how long it will take to watch it. Um, and we always provide a prompt. So in this case is what are the practices that Paulette used to encourage or discourage student participation? And what techniques have you found most helpful in preparing students to engage in class discussions? So we want you to bring your expertise so that your colleagues can hear from you because oftentimes we look at things through um, one lens and we aren't looking at something the way one of our colleagues might. So it's an opportunity for you to learn as I indicated before with and from one another. I love when faculty come here and they go ahead and share, oh, this is something I've done. This is something I've created. And then somebody else hops in and says, hey, you said you created this. Can you share this? And I'm always like, hey, you know, don't reinvent the wheel. If you can grab something from somebody else and tweak it to go ahead and fit your purposes and your discipline, then ask somebody to go ahead and share it and be willing to share those things with your colleagues. Um, I said on a previous information session, I have had faculty who've asked their colleagues, hey, you implement this practice in your classroom. Would you be willing to let me come in and sit in your classroom and see how you implement it? Um, sometimes people ask if they will assist them with implementing a practice. And I will say I had a group of course takers. Um, my last time that I took it, I had course takers who came together to co-teach a, a class, um, which was really great. Um, Chelsea, I'm going to, I know this is a part you like as well. So if you would like to go ahead and make any comments, please feel free. Um, and I'll gonna, answer uh, Shelly's question, I think. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> Yeah, so I think that this is a section that, like Jody said, is really um, a rich area for folks to communicate across, um, you know, the, the courses that they're teaching. Uh, this is one of the areas where I think faculty have found um, 
a lot of resources on campus, like you're sharing different strategies and uh, practices and uh, just ideas with each other. This is also the area where your facilitators are probably going to be most engaged. Uh, what we tend to do, or what I usually do, is have the facilitators, each of the facilitators in the cohorts, kind of summarize what's going on in this discussion session. So if perchance you don't have time to review everything that's being said in this discussion area, um, you'll see an announcement from me uh, either at the beginning of the, the week, the next week, or at the end of that week, um, summarizing what's been happening in here and kind of pulling out some quotes of some really great ideas that are specific to uh, areas or things that are happening within your particular cohort. So it's just a really great time to communicate uh, with faculty in, in different areas. And Jody, you said you're going to address Shelly's question. Yeah. So I just sent a quick little um, chat there with Shelly, but just in case somebody doesn't see it, um, you will see other students, different ages um, um, in the different demonstration videos, but you'll also hear from them um, in some of the other videos as well. In addition to that, um, Shelly, just so you know, this course, while this is offered completely in the face-to-face -face environment, and you have these accesses to these resources, there is also a course that is specific to the online environment where you would see those um, online demonstrations and you would see how people are engaging people via Zoom. Um, so if Chelsea wants to say anything more about that, but you guys are offering the face-to-face -face environment, but the beauty of what you're asking is when you come together in this observe and analyze form, this is where I say, that's kind of what you want to know. Hey, I'm doing this in an online forum. Who else is doing this in an online forum? Who can help me? Ask your colleagues, um, because when we come together and have these conversations, this is where we can really support one another. Um, and we find that that's how, you know, you, we learn from each other. Oh, I never thought about it that way. I wouldn't have even consider doing something like that in my online forum, but it's an opportunity for you to ask your colleagues to go ahead and help you out in these places. Um, and yeah, as thanks, really Jody. Yep, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to, I was going to take Thomas's um, comment here as well. Um, so, so in regards to um, the online instruction, there are uh, several faculty members who are teaching solely online for whatever reason, whether it's just that semester or that's just they're teaching with eCampus or another online program, and they have still found it beneficial to go through the course and, as Jody said, um, talk with each other about their practices. So you won't be the only one who's teaching online in this course. And as Jody mentioned in um, one of the previous sections, there are implementation resources for folks who are teaching online. So they're face-to-face -face and they're online versions as well. Um, and I suspect that even for the face-to-face -face, uh, implementing strategies, there are things that you can do there um, that apply to online learning as well. You just might have to modify it, but that's something that you can reflect on too, you know, how you modified that particular strategy. So I think, Shelly, I think that um, there will be enough rich discussion and opportunities to talk across the different modalities that we're using. Um, and I, I always think it's really nice to see how creative faculty get uh, when talking about switching between the different modalities because there's a lot of um, generative ideas that are happening. So Thomas, I wanted to address your question really quickly here. Um, what I've been doing this semester is offering office hours, and that is a time for folks to come in and have that targeted time. Um, folks haven't been using it that way so far. Um, it's mostly just them coming in and asking questions, but if that's something that you'd like me to set up, I can certainly uh, have a Zoom room scheduled for uh, a group of you who want to go through the course together and use that time to be able to, to speak with each other. That's something that we could set up once the cohort cohort um, has started, or at least uh, a week prior to the cohort starting. So uh, keep that idea in your back pocket, and we can talk about it when you sign up. And Chelsea, I did that um, all year long for my faculty, and they loved it. Very similar to what Tom said, he wants an opportunity to come together in a designated time. I know that I'm going to be doing this at this given point in time. We're going to have these discussions, and um, it's really a great opportunity. And it was always optional. So whoever could make it could make it. And I only did it every two to three weeks, um, and I covered two modules usually. So great opportunity. So thank you for that question, Tom. So moving along in the course, and you get a chance to, you know, you're writing your own um, response, but you get to reply to your colleagues here, and you also can go ahead and like a response. The next portion, so while that is my favorite part of the course, this is the most important part of the course. This is where you're implementing those practices. Um, so you see those objectives are here again. 
Um, and again, you have access to those online resources. So great ways to go ahead and put on that thinking hat and think outside the box. How can I go ahead and incorporate this in my online forum? And again, use that um, discussion forum to ask your colleagues, hey, does anybody have any suggestions um, about how to implement this in the online forum? So Shelly, I would, I would really throw it out there to my colleagues and say, hey, I want, I want some feedback. I want some help. But you identify those practices that you want here. Um, so if you want to do the sequencing questions, you can go ahead and download that um, resource right here. You don't have to go back to the previous screen. And you are going to be asked to respond to three questions. Um, so we're going to ask you to go ahead and there is a reflection guide. That is a template. That's what you're going to want to pull up. And you're going to respond to those three questions. And I'm going to pull it up so you can see what those three questions look like. I'm going to pull down to your rubric so you can see. You're always responding to meet the criteria. Um, in this case, they were asking you about two practices. So I scrolled down a little bit further. But your first question is going to ask you what practice from the model module did you go ahead and implement in the classroom? So to meet, to uh, to meet the criteria, you're simply identifying the practice that you plan to implement and either explain how you implemented it or share why you selected it. Um, Chelsea, you will likely have faculty members who want to exceed. I always had faculty members who wanted to exceed. It is not about an A, B, or C. It is about meeting the criteria and moving on. But if you are one of those exceeders, um, you just need to add the additional pieces. So you can see in this case, you can answer this question in a matter of, of sentences, um, you know, what it was that you implemented and, and or maybe why you implemented it. Your second question is, after you've gone ahead and implemented it, we want to know what was the impact on students. Um, if you had a challenge, um, if you want to exceed, again, you're going to have to add that additional piece. And the final question we're asking you is, what other steps will be taken to continue to refine your use of the practices shared in this module? So again, more time, different content, didn't work out this week with the curriculum I was working on. What was it? Something as simple as maybe, like again, the time. Um, maybe you didn't provide enough time or maybe you weren't clear enough with something, but what do you need to reflect on to go ahead and make this more um, uh, of an impact with your students the next time? So after you submit that reflection, you have a reflection survey. Reflection survey is looking at two pieces as it related to your experience with this course. One, we're asking you, what did you learn? What was brand new? What did you learn more about? And what was a refresher? We also want to know, what did you implement and what are you planning to implement? So in this case, this module had 10 practices. So which mod or which practices did you not implement this week that you would like to implement at a later point in time? And you're going to go ahead and check off on those. It might be three of them. It might be seven of them. But you'll go ahead and make a note of those practices that you want to implement. And I always encourage folks that on the next screen, you have a note to your future self where we're asking you to write a note that you see for yourself. Your colleagues um, aren't going to see this. Um, maybe it's something about the, the content that you did the practice with this week, something that worked really well, something that you found to be really valuable, something you want to avoid doing. You can write that in your notes to future self, but you can also write in the note to future self how it is that you're planning to implement practices in the future, because oftentimes we get to that point later on and we don't remember how we wanted to implement something. So I always tell people right here, write a note to yourself as to what you were thinking when you engaged with the course experience at this point in time. So there's a refresher for you when you come back and you look at your note to future self. Um, I also had a course taker who would make notes to her and self in the note to future self. And she would say, at this point in the semester, you're going to be doing X, you need to remember to do. And then she would make notes to herself about what she needed to remember to do as it related to those pieces um, that she was learning about. And our course ends with references. So as I indicated, when we did our focus groups, course takers said they wanted to know who was in it. They wanted to know where they were from um, and those different disciplines. So you get to see that information here. And then anything that we point out to, you get to see that information as well at the bottom. If we can't point out to it like we do here, I always tell folks to reach out to their wonderful librarians. Um, they are always a great resource at every institution. So that's the, the course experience. So you have an idea of what it is that you're signing up for. You know um, what each one of those modules is going to look like and um, you understand what is expected of you. I'm gonna stop talking. You guys were great with asking questions um, as we engaged with this, but if there's anybody else that has um, a question, 
um, for me, um, please go ahead and unmute yourself or put it in the chat. And um, if you have questions that are specific for Chelsea, you can go ahead and ask Chelsea too. Hi, yes, I'm wondering if you can comment more on how much opportunity there is for real time discussion. I guess I'm an online faculty member and I've been doing this for 16 years and I have discussion for fatigue and I'm looking for, it's also a very lonely and isolating kind of position. So I'm looking for actual rich discussion with faculty members that are, that's not, no offense, asynchronous. Yeah, Shelly, that's a that's a great point to make. And I feel like um, should you uh, sign up for the course and Thomas sign up for the course, you'd be the first two folks who might want to um, connect. And, and I would be certainly open to, um, you know, uh, using the CFE space at Olds Camp or our uh, CFE classroom, Olds Camp 106 and having, you know, biweekly um, meetings uh, for synchronous discussions in addition to our summary discussions that happen after every block. Um, that's not something that some of the faculty were interested in doing this cohort or this current cohort, um, but I'm certainly open to facilitating something like that should a number of you want to get together. Um, even if it's just two of you, I would be fine facilitating something like that. Okay, thank you. I have one more question if I'm not hogging. <laughs> no, go for it. Um, I'm wondering what high enrollment online teaching strategies may exist in this class. So for, in other words, for, um, you know, classes that have more than 30 people, let's say 60 plus, um, I also teach in an online accelerated format. I'm wondering if there's, uh, engagement strategies for that as well. Thank you. Not, at least not in, I don't think Jody, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, not in this, this particular face-to-face -face version, um, but that's something that, um, Shelly, I think that maybe I could help facilitate that and be able to, you know, kind of load some additional resources um, and think through that. Um, Jody, I don't know if you want to speak to that as well. Yep, so you'll actually come across some of the modules that will talk about large enrollment classes and they'll go ahead and share whether this is a large enrollment class or you have a small class of 15 to 20 or, you know, 100 students or more in it, you know, these are some things that you can use with your students. So you will see some of that throughout the course, Shelly. In addition to that, I'd go ahead and I, again, I encourage you and I tell people all the time that observe and analyze discussion forum or if it's online or if you come together and Tom and other faculty members come together and ask your colleagues, you know, hey, what are you doing in your, your sessions that, you know, provides this opportunity in these larger classrooms to go ahead and bring voices to the conversation. So I encourage you to go ahead and, and do some poking there. Okay, thank you. Yep. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Shelly, Josh had a question for you about the program that you're with in the chat. <laughs> Okay, I'm sorry. I took my reading glasses off. <laughs> no, okay, sorry. You mentioned hybrid accelerated. I was just curious what you were with. No, I'm not high. I'm not hybrid. I'm 100% okay. asynchronous online through the eCampus program in the College of Technology, oh, okay. Architecture, and Applied Engineering. And my undergraduate classes have about 60 students in them right now in seven week online sessions, and it's rough. And my, I also teach in the graduate program in instructional design. So just trying to find ways to maintain the quality, the rich interaction. Um, and like I said, I, I would like to talk to people. I'm really discussion formed out. <laughs> I don't wanna take more forums on. Yeah. <laughs> I will say I notice, uh, Josh, you're with the physical therapy program. I notice a few of you here are with physical therapy, and I'm guessing you're part of the uh, doctor of physical therapy program that's yes. going to be fully, well, mostly online with a few hybrid sessions here and there. So Shelly, if these folks end up signing up, you would have some folks in, in a similar um, situation as you. So I think that there could be some rich discussion back and forth, but yeah. in, in a different format other than a discussion forum. <laughs> 
<laughs> Sorry. I hope anybody who teach is teaching online, they will understand where I'm coming from. <laughs> You've just 100%. Yeah. yeah. I've had that experience. <laughs> No, Shelly, it's a really valuable opportunity. So again, I did it and I said it was optional. It was amazing how many people just wanted to come back each time. And then when I was done, because I always had an agenda when I was done, it was amazing how many people stayed in my center and were like, oh, can we, can we hang out for a little bit? And I'm like, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I provided I, food, Chelsea. That was actually a little <laughs> bit of a, a, you know, feed them and they will come. I do want to say, um, as an online faculty member who has an instructional design background, the the actual art and science behind what you all have designed here in Canvas is amazing. So I want to, I know that probably was a whole team that put this together, but it is phenomenal. And I'm also a Quality Matters Master Reviewer. So I, you know, I can respect it from that level as well. So just for anybody here, um, I can already tell it. It's very well aligned between the outcomes and the assessments and all the instruction that's in the middle. So kudos, kudos, A plus. Thank you very yeah, much, Shelly, appreciate that. Definitely a beautiful course and it's well, well organized. <clears throat> Are there any other questions? Well, should you all sign up, I will be working on figuring out some in-person uh, ways that we can get together and just sharing ideas and bringing food and coffee into the mix. <laughs> well, I'm going to hit um, stop on our recording. <laughs>